This is Incredible Stories Podcast, Episode 21, Roses, the Empress's New Groove. Hello, hello, people. It's time for another Incredible Stories podcast. I'm Josh Virla, your Nectarous host, and thanks for being here. Now, what comes to mind when I say the word flower to you? Probably pretty sweet-smelling plants available anywhere from gas stations and street corners to grocery stores and florists. And if I were to ask you to name a flower, You may come up with tulips, daisies, or maybe even sunflowers. But I'd be willing to bet, if we were on Family Feud, roses would be the number one answer. And the survey says... Ah, yes, roses. The ubiquitous symbol of love and beauty and the go-to flower for Valentine's Day and saris. With about 110 million roses sold each year, it's hard to argue with their popularity. But what if I told you that the rose owes a large part of its popularity and availability to Napoleon Bonaparte's wife, Empress Josephine? Her love of roses ignited a flurry of development while bridging war-torn countries. Here's what I know. Now, roses are very old plants. Fossil evidence suggests they are at least 35 million years old. But roses didn't begin to be cultivated in gardens until about 5,000 years ago, give or take a few years. Today, there are between 150 and 300 species of roses and thousands of cultivars, or varieties. Now, roses are kind of a complicated group of plants, so some people disagree with the number of true rose species, That's why we have a range of 150 to 300 species, but either way, it's still a lot. Now, before I get into Empress Josephine, let's take a look at how roses were looked at before her time. Thought to have originated in Central Asia, the rose spread throughout the Northern Hemisphere to Europe, Northern Africa, and even the Americas. Early civilizations, like the Egyptians, Greeks, and Chinese, began growing roses in gardens around 5,000 years ago. And they would use the roses in things like ceremonies, for perfumes, medicine, and to add a touch of a sexiness. In fact, it is said that Cleopatra used roses to seduce Mark Antony. You go, girl! Apparently, the combination of sweet aroma, boobs, booty, and power really make you horny. So anyway, the Romans traded and developed some rose species as they loved that stuff and, you know, had a vast empire so it was easy for them. After the fall of Rome though, roses' popularity fluctuated through the times, rising and falling according to gardening trends, until the 1800s when Josephine got involved. Born in 1763 as Marie-Joseph Rose Tachère de la Pagière. And if you know anything, listeners, my French is impeccable, so I'm sure I said all that correctly. Now, Josephine initially went by the name Rose, how fortuitous, and all her friends and family called her by this name. But when she met and eventually married Napoleon, he just called her Josephine. You know, to be different, uh, Josephine by any other name, am I right guys? It wasn't until 1798 that Josephine really got into the rosification of her garden. In fact, in 1799, she bought a quaint little shack called the Chateau de Malmaison, seven miles from Paris proper, which sat on 150 acres. Like I said, it was quaint. Now, at this time, Napoleon was a general and not yet Emperor of France. He was off fighting in the Egyptian campaign, but apparently he was quite angry at the purchase of this house when he returned because A, it was run down, and B, because Josephine used pretty much all the money he gained from the Egyptian campaign to buy this fixer-upper. She purchased it for about 300,000 francs, and that was in that money back then. 
So 300,000 francs in 1799 was equivalent to about 45,454 US dollars in 1799. But if we adjust for inflation in today's money, that would be like spending about 650,000 US dollars on a dilapidated mansion. And this doesn't factor in the actual renovation costs. Like I said, it was a dump and needed to be fixed up. But eventually, Napoleon's anger subsided because of the jewel that Malmaison would become. But I think he just redirected his anger. Sacre bleu, Germain, my wife, she is spending on my francs. On what, sir? Houses, Jeremy, houses! She started watching these home improvement themed operas by Joanne and Chip something or other, and now she is obsessed with the bones of the stump. She's spending money left and right. Did you know it used to be a leper colony? What shall I do? Well, sir, you can't take the house away. Happy wife, happy life, am I right? Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, ha ha, Jeremy! You are wise beyond your years. Oh, <laughs> no. Not like I could just have her beheaded. Or could I? Hmm. Sir, perhaps a bit hasty. The roses do smell nice. Maybe just more military campaigns? Is that wise, Jeremy? Well, you get more money and you can take out some frustration. Oh, ha, Jeremy. Sure, why not? I have uh, nothing else to do. To the steeds! Man, Napoleon's French isn't as good as I remembered him to have been. But well, anyways, Josephine soon turned the Chateau de Malmaison into a magnificent garden. Her goal was to transform the estate into the most beautiful and curious garden in all of Europe, and she seemed to be well on the way. Her gardens boasted rare and exotic animals like kangaroos and black swans from recently discovered Australia. Napoleon, liking how the gardens were looking, decided to add 5,000 additional acres to the estate. And Josephine also had her greenhouses heated by coal-burning stoves, a big technology of the time. And, of course, she would need this because of all the tropical and exotic plants she had, like pineapples and oranges. You see, her and Napoleon seemed to have been keen on nature, and Josephine was kind of a competitive gardener. She collected and grew around 200 new types of plants, and then these plants were new to France. She didn't, like, just invent new plants. But the piece de resistance of her garden were the roses. Uh, Josephine wrote that, quote, I wish that Malmaison may soon become the source of riches for all of France." Unquote. This seemed to be a reasonable quest by her. By 1815, France had emerged as a leading rose-growing country, and also was exporting large amounts of roses. And a lot of their exports went to far, far away lands like New Orleans, and other Mississippi River-based cities to the Americas. Now, being the top of French court, Josephine's interests drove the interests of other French socialites, and they too began to collect and grow roses. And the English high society, wanting to keep up with the French and the fashions of the time, also took up an interest in roses. The English and the French had a kind of a love-hate relationship. Maybe frenemies would be a good term, except they were at this time at war, so enemies would be more proper term. The Napoleonic Wars saw British and French forces clash between 1803 and 1814, right in the sweet spot of when Josephine was in her rose phase. But despite this, Josephine's rose gardens seemed to unite both countries. Napoleon looked the other way when Josephine broke French law, requesting English seeds and plants be brought to her from captured ships. And she was looking for roses, obviously. It's good to be empress. 
You see, Napoleon even instructed his officers to look for and bring back new roses from where they were campaigning. The English, who were clearly at war with the French, even allowed roses to cross their borders so that Josephine could have them. They even allowed her chief gardener to travel back and forth freely between the two countries. And Josephine even employed Englishman John Kennedy to help lay out her famous rose gardens. You know, this would have been a good opportunity for a spy to kind of pretend to be a gardener. However, that didn't happen here. So this rose infatuation only grew the backyard enthusiast's um, enthusiasm to participate in growing roses, but also to hybridize more types of roses. And ultimately, this hobby created many of the varieties we're so familiar with today. It's true that Josephine was the bar in regards to the standard of rose gardens, even after her death in 1814. Her impact on the rose community resonated throughout the years. Between 1805 and 1810, Josephine had collected about 260 rose varieties for her gardens, and French growers cultivated about 2,000 different types of the sweet flower. And in just another decade, they had developed 5,000 varieties. In 1803, Josephine spent approximately 2,600 pounds with English nurseries. And that's about 370,000 US dollars today. So that's a lot of money to spend on this gardening hobby. I think I couldn't get away with spending a couple hundred at Home Depot. Now, the Malmaison wasn't just a personal garden. Josephine also set up nurseries for distribution to French growers. Perhaps one of the greatest contributions to the rose world were a set of watercolor commissions by artist Pierre Joseph Redoubt, formerly the court painter of Marie Antoinette. Josephine commissioned Pierre to paint the roses of her gardens and his work became the standard reference material for roses for many years to come. In fact, it is still used today when trying to identify older variety of roses. I believe he painted about 170 rose cultivars and many are seen in gardens today. Now, after her death and Napoleon's defeat, the gardens at Malmaison were neglected until its restoration in the 20th century by famous French architect Pierre Humbert. Today, you can visit the chateau and I'll link in the show notes if you want to book a trip. But something else that happened after her death was that all the rose rock stars of the time dispersed and continued their work on roses throughout France. One of Josephine's rose suppliers and chief gardener was André Dupont, previously director of the Luxembourg Gardens located in Paris. This was a big garden and nursery type thing in, in Paris and a big supplier of Josephine's gardens. So André Dupont was one of the first gardeners to produce roses from seeds and the founder of the Gardens Rose Collection. You see, the Luxembourg was known for their large rose gardens as well. His successor at the Luxembourg Gardens was Julian Alexander Hardy, who went on to develop some of the very roses grown today, such as the Madame Hardy, named after his wife, and the Safrano. Hardy's assistant at the Luxembourg Gardens was Jacques Julien Margotin. He founded a rose nursery and kept hybridizing roses, continuing the legacy that Josephine had laid. And perhaps the most famous French rose hybridizer, Jean-Pierre Vibert, he was a soldier during the Napoleonic Wars and fought in Napoleon's first army. Well, he got injured and when he returned to Paris, he started a hardware shop near Dupont's Rosarium. And being so close to an empress's favorite hobby and gardener, cultivated his own interest in roses. Now, contemporarily, there was a guy named Jacques Louise de Semet, who Vibert had befriended. De Semet had a large Paris based nursery, and in this nursery of his, he cultivated about 6,000 ornamental roses. But near the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, 
His gardens were destroyed and he had to flee the country because of political reasons. But Vibert stepped in and saved the remaining breeding notes, roses, stocks, and seedlings. The Semet's gardens contained about 10,000 seedlings, which Vibert rescued and planted in his own countryside garden. From there, what choice did Vibert have but to become the most influential rose hybridizer of all time, and one of the founders of what is today known as the National Horticulture Society of France. Man, all this driven from Josephine's interest. So because of Empress Josephine's interest in amassing and developing a rose garden beyond approach, we have what we have today in terms of what you think of as a rose. Today, roses are divided into three groups, wild roses, old garden roses, and modern garden roses. Old garden roses are those varieties in existence before 1867, so well after Josephine's death. But within the garden rose grouping, roses are further categorized according to hybrid lineages. And particularly, all modern garden roses can be traced to Josephine's hobby. You see, the rose you most likely think of as a modern rose are hybrid tea roses. This is the standard rose of the floral industry. And the first hybrid tea rose? Well, it was called the La France a pink rose cultivar found by rose hybridizer Jean-Baptiste André Goulot in 1867, the cutoff date for modern garden roses. And this special little flower most likely got its parental lineage from a rose called the Madame Falcotte, a French rose. Thanks, Empress Josephine. So you see, everything that was happening in France around the roses gave us what we have today. And that all stemmed because Josephine was pushing the trend of rose gardening. And now you know what I know. So I don't find myself thinking about flower origins that much, like at all, surprise. But roses have held so much allure through history, their beauty often juxtaposed with that which is horrible. Take the Wars of the Roses, for instance. A 30-ish year long conflict for control of the English throne in the 1400s between the House of Lancaster, associated with a red rose, and the House of York, represented by white roses. You also have the morbid children's song of Ring Around the Rosy. Also, you have the band Guns N' Roses. And who can forget the song Every Rose Has a Thorn by the band Poison. Now, you also get roses strewn through the playground of poetry and literature. Roses are red, violets are blue, snow white and rose red, etc, etc. Much too numerous to dive into. But these symbols are just a testament to the popularity of the flower. But it is amazing that one woman had such a huge influence on such a niche aspect of gardening that it spread and created a culture of rose obsession that is evident today. And fortunately, or unfortunately, for relationships everywhere, we have her to thank for giving us the gift of having something to gift for special occasions. And thanks to the continued demand for this flowering beauty, it can be an expensive gift. Thankfully, my wife doesn't like roses, so suck on that societal expectations! But now for something my wife does like, and that is of course, the haiku! Ancient, historic, roses, the queen of flowers, 1999. And that's all the time this week, guys. Check out our main site for other incredible stories on IncredibleStoriesPodcast.com. Send me an email or haiku. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at IncredPod. Rate us on iTunes and peep us out on YouTube and Stitcher. For Incredible Stories Podcast, I'm Josh. And remember, the journey of a thousand tales begins with the first word. <laughs>